for the last session or the last talk in this session this afternoon and welcome to those of you joining the education track for the first time. Our presentation this afternoon is by Andrew Williams. He's an astronomer who moved from research into telescope and instrument automation, starting with an automated search for supernova and extra solar planets using an optical telescope, and more recently has been working in the operations team for a large radio telescope in Murchison in WA. And Andrew's going to be talking to us today about 3D rendering with Python and some of his experiences there. So I'll hand over to you, Andrew. We should have time for questions at the end as well. So hold on to your questions for, for that as well. Hello, everyone. Um, this is what I do now during the day. Um, and a quick plug, we're looking for a senior developer with web skills. So contact me if you're interested in a job in Perth. Um, I used to do a lot of lecturing. And most of this talk is about uh, 3D rendering that I use for teaching astronomy. Uh, the teaching that I was doing was astronomy, but the, the vPython, visual Python stuff will be equally suitable for chemistry or a whole heap of other things, or for teaching Python, because kids like 3D and seeing things uh, that are cool. So there are a lot of reasons to use animations to teach concepts. Um, a lot of concepts are easier to understand if they're demonstrated visually. And basically, if you want to generate some sort of animation to demonstrate electromagnetism or an orbit or something like that, your choices are look online to see if somebody else has made an animation, pay someone to make a, an app or a movie for you, like a media company, which is what you do if you're you know, issuing a press release and, and um, you found some amazing new neutron star or something like that, or you do it yourself. And for 3D stuff, Blender and Povray are great, but the, the thing is there's a huge learning curve. I've tried to teach myself Povray three times now. I've never tried to use Blender, but I've seen other people using it. And it's, it's a lot to do if it's not your main job. Uh, and the other thing is that they tend to produce either a static image or a movie that you play and pause and maybe fast forward through or drag a, a slider through, but you can't really interact with it. So um, animations that you can actually interact with, uh, there are some great JavaScript applets. I'm not a JavaScript person. I don't know how to do that, but I can do uh, Python. So I produced. A lot of stuff using Visual Python or VPython was developed by Bruce Sherwood, Ruth Chabay, and David Scherer in the year 2000. Uh, they were teaching a course in mechanics. They wrote their own language to do 3D rendering. Uh, David Scherer was one of their students. He uh, implemented this uh, new uh, Python-based uh, 3D rendering environment, and they developed it and worked on it. And it used OpenGL to, to open a window directly on the operating system screen. Uh, um, well, they didn't use OpenGL to open the window. They, they used OpenGL calls to control, th control the window and display 3D stuff. Uh, in 2011, David Scherer worked on what's called GlowScript, which is a 3D rendering environment that was entirely browser-based. So you, you wrote some, uh, not Python, but some other uh, script in a, in a web window. And it ran sort of a 3D API that you could use to do rendering. And in 2014, it kind of became a rapid script, which is kind of like Python. It looks at first glance like Python, but in a web interface. And then a guy called John Cody uh, ported it back to plain Python. So you can run actual Python in a, an environment on your desktop and use a web browser to do the 3D rendering using WebGL instead of OpenGL. That removes a lot of the operating system dependence of opening a window and making OpenGL calls. So the classic vPython, which is the one that actually opened a window on your desktop, kind of went away. Between about 2014 and 2017, uh, vPython or Visual Python was kind of difficult to use. You had to uh, install it in particular ways. You had to use a web environment. In 2017, it became much easier. You could just do conda install vPython and three lines of code, and you can do 3D rendering. GlowScript is the, the web API. You, you write Python code in the browser. You run examples in the browser. You don't need to log in. If you want to write your own code, you can use a Google account, or you can download uh, the GlowScript HTML page that has all of the, um, the JavaScript that does user management and stuff. You don't need Google accounts to actually do anything. Or you can just cut and paste the code and the examples into a text file and run it using Python 3.7 on your own machine. Now, here's the dangerous bit. This will probably not work. So here's GlowScript. So GlowScript gives you a nice, easy way to start playing with 3D Python. 
There's a whole bunch of examples. Uh, here's an example of, let's see, bouncing. We'll view the code. We display the caption. We can see that we're just creating some boxes. They've got positions and sizes and colors. The ball's a sphere. It's got a certain mass and momentum, but this mass and momentum aren't understood in any way by the, by the 3D library. They're stuff that you use yourself to calculate how it changes. So you just write a function, and you say ball.position equals ball.position plus the momentum divided by the mass multiplied by the time step. So you're actually doing the physics modeling in your code. And when you change the position of the ball, you see it move on the screen. And there's some very simple tests here to see if you've hit the walls. If you have, you reverse the direction. And you just repeat this move function over and over again. And you can run it. And what you see is a ball bouncing around inside a box. So there are many other programs. You can demonstrate concepts in physics, rotating cubes. You can do 3D plots. Uh, there are some, a whole heap of physics lessons here by Bruce and uh, Ruth. Um, a ball and spring model of a solid. You could do this for chemistry as well, demonstrating the shapes of molecules. Uh, there are masses and masses of very cool things for illustrating things like the cross product of two vectors. You can move one vector around and see the cross product of the result. And you can actually interact with this, not just a movie that you're playing. You can choose to fix the length and change the angle, or fix the angle and change the length. Uh, you can also write programs in Jupyter Notebooks. Here's an example. So I am importing the library and creating a window. When I run this, nothing happens. But let's say I want to do a very simple demo that just moves the ball up and down at a constant speed. I create a sphere at position 0, 10, 0. It's a certain radius and a certain color. I create the floor, which is a box that sits underneath it. I sleep for four seconds to wait for me to actually scroll up to the, the window. And you just do loop forever. Add uh, the velocity times the time step to the y value of the ball. The position is the attribute that defines where it is. It has sub-attributes called x, y, and z. If the y value is less than 0.5, or the position is greater than, or the y value is greater than 10, then invert the velocity. So in other words, um, invert every time it reaches the top or the bottom. So it's waiting for four seconds. And you can pan and zoom. You can fly around. You can watch that program as it runs. You can see the cell is still running. It's a loop that never finishes. That doesn't look very physically real. So let's restart the kernel and try something more interesting. And Paint Shop Pro is advertising to me. All right, let's run that step and go some real physics. Create the ball on the, the floor again. This time we define the velocity as zero. G, our gravity, gravitational constant is minus 9.8. And we're doing a new frame every 10 milliseconds. So we, again, change the velocity, uh, change the position of the ball using the velocity and time step. Only this time, we say, if the ball dot y is less than 5, then invert the velocity. Otherwise, let the velocity equals uh, velocity plus g times the time step. In other words, we change the velocity by the gravitational constant. So when we run this, we see a physically realistic bouncing ball. Again, we can pan and zoom. And you can play around with this. You can um, uh, use attributes on the ball. You can actually use things like ball vol velocity. You can add a second ball and keep track of both velocities. Or you can look at velocities in 3D. For example, here, the uh, value of g is a vector. Its x component is 0. In other words, gravity doesn't point sideways. It points in the y direction and not the z direction. 
uh, and we can define the initial velocity of the ball as in one meter per second uh, sideways, uh, zero velocity vertically and zero velocity uh, front to back. And we can do the same thing again. We um, add the, the, the value g to the velocity as a vector instead of as a scalar. So if we run this, we can see our ball starts on the left and gravity pulls it downwards, but it's constantly moving at one meter per second to the left. And we can tweak it. We can say, all right, what happens if it doesn't um, bounce evenly? What happens if our velocity is 0 0.8 times g times the time step? So we add 0 0.8 of g to the velocity every time. It's going to be a damped bounce. So let's try that one. Modifying demos on the fly is how things crash. So it starts off up here. Doesn't bounce quite as high the next time. Oh. OK, that didn't work. That'll teach me to modify demo on the fly. And when it reaches the edge of the wall, it goes away. And the auto scaling tries to keep up, but it can't. So let's try running stuff outside of the IDE, outside of uh, the web interface. Because controversial opinion, I hate Jupyter Notebooks. I loathe them. You give up all of the advantage of a decent development environment for something. I'm not sure what. Anyway, I like a real editor. So let's take orbits. Kepler's third law says that uh, orbits trace out the same area in a unit time. In other words, an object orbiting the sun, if you looked at um, how much area it would trace out when it's close to the sun, if it's an elliptical orbit, compared to how far away it is when it's uh, far away from the sun, you get the same area. Now, this is actually modeling the physics of the orbit. You can see this large star here is 100 times heavier than a small star, so it's moving slightly. As the object moves away, uh, this, uh, they're both orbiting the same center of math. If you click, you can draw a line one second apart, and the area between the, um, the curve and those two lines is exactly the same whether it's here or out here. Smaller angles because the angular velocity is lower, but um, the area is the same. Or we can demonstrate how Mars orbit works. Mars has a period of 686 days in its orbit around the sun. The Earth has a period of 365 days. If they started out at the same point, then every 780 days, Mars and the Earth would line up again. So after 780 days, now's a good time to send a spaceship to Mars. 780 days later will be another good time to send a spaceship to Mars. And you can pan and zoom and fly around and zoom in and out, stuff like that. So simple concepts that involve moving or multiple objects are really good for illustrating like that. Uh, what's the next one? The moon. Moon phases. That's a really common thing that people want demonstrated. That is the sun on the left, the moon on the right. You can define lights inside vPython. You lights are any other object. You just define a, an object. You say, you know, light one equals vPython dot light, and you give it a position and a color. So I've defined some light coming from the left, and you can see the Earth spinning, the moon spinning. That arrow represents somebody standing on the moon. They're now standing on the moon, and it's starting to, the sun is starting to rise for that astronaut on the moon. And now they're in daylight. But if we pan around and look from the sun, then we see the lit up side of the sun, and we always see the lit up side of the moon. Pan in the other direction, we're now looking toward the sun. We always see the dark side of the Earth and the dark side of the moon. But both of them are rotating. It's often uh, a common fallacy is people to say the moon doesn't rotate. It does rotate. You can see it's rotating. That arrow on the moon is going round and round. But it's always rotating as it goes around the Earth. So the arrow always points towards the Earth. So you can look at very simple concepts like shadows and phases and eclipses and things like that using modeling like this. Uh, this is the Tully Nearby Galaxy Catalog. Now, there's no uh, movement or interaction here. 
but this is 3,000 odd galaxies in the Tully nearby galaxy catalog, and the red one is the Milky Way. And we can pan and zoom around them, you can click on them to see what their names are, uh, and you can see that there's a big gap. If you zoom in, you can see that around the axis of the Milky Way, there's a gap where there are no galaxies. That's not because there are really no galaxies around there, it's just that galaxies are really hard to see through the disk of the Milky Way. And you can also see that they're in a cube. Uh, galaxies aren't really distributed in cubes. Uh, that's just the catalog. But you can see that there's a bunch of clusters. There's the Virgo cluster and other clusters out there. And you can start talking about how galaxies clump into clusters just the same way um, solar systems clump together. It's gravitational interaction. Now, there's lots of videos that fly through um, different galaxy catalogs, but not many that you can actually play with in real time. What I've spent most time playing with uh, is, actually, let's just show you one quick demo. All of the stuff I've showed you has been the current version of vPython. This is something that I wrote in the old version, and I haven't ported to the new vPython yet, just to show you how complicated the rendering can be. That is a model of a square kilometer array station with 256 Christmas tree antennas showing uh, the antennas and a rendering of, this is pretty slow, uh, a rendering of uh, some cable distribution problems we're having, just to see if, uh, as a test, to see if there was room for this box in the middle and the, the thickness of the cable bundles coming out of that box and how it related to the gaps between antennas. Uh, but you can do some quite complicated rendering. Now, I'm not going to show you this code because it's ugly with many, many hundreds of lines of definitions for where all of these loops and wire come out. But you can do some pretty cool modeling with it, uh, and you can uh, animate this as well. You can have a, the antenna move around, or you can demonstrate rays of light coming from uh, an astronomical source or whatever else you wanted to do. I haven't ported that to vPython yet because it uses some uh, 3D model constructs that I haven't worked out how to port yet. What I spent most time doing is um, numerical modeling for some third year students. I was teaching third year uh, astronomy and talking about solar system formation. Now, to do this, I gave them this code that I wrote, uh, which would model the solar system in 3D. So this is a simulation of the eight planets in the solar system plus 1,000 asteroids. And this is modeling the gravitational interactions with, between all of the planets and the sun to model how each of the planets move. And there's 1,000 asteroids that are treated as massless test particles that are only affected by the gravity of the planets. So they start off at random positions in a, in a range distributed between three and a half and five and a half AU. And as they rotate around, uh, because of their own gravity and the gravity of the sun, they interact with Jupiter and get kicked out. So the reason I wrote this code was to give the code to the students and let them model interactions that happened in the early solar system. For example, there are gaps in the asteroid belt where the period of the asteroid is a, a, a multiple of the period of Jupiter. In other words, let's say there's an asteroid that goes around twice every time Jupiter goes around once. Every second time it goes around the sun, it's happening to line up with Jupiter in the same place and getting a little bit of extra gravitational pull from Jupiter. So if you let this simulation run for a week or two, you'd see what's called Kirkwood gaps, these gaps in harmonics uh, of Jupiter's orbit open up. You'd also start to see Trojan asteroids. Trojans are asteroids that um, uh, move around 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter and 60 degrees behind Jupiter uh, because they're stable gravitational points that they can be in a nice stable orbit and not get uh, kicked out by Jupiter. So you can do some modeling of the early solar system. In reality, these points aren't massless. In the early solar system, Jupiter captured a lot of uh, asteroids and its orbit was changed by the asteroids. It just doesn't model that. And the 3D simulation is just a toy, but it's still quite a lot of fun to play with. Uh, you can do things like change the parameters. Let's go in here. Okay, I'll go a bit. So let's say instead of starting them all at random positions around the sun, let's start them all at 12 degrees, picked out at random, uh, instead of uh, out of a 0 to 360 degree range. So they, they'll all start out at an evenly uh, distributed range from three astronomical units to five and a half astronomical units away from the sun, but instead of starting distributed around in, in different orbits, they'll all start at the same position. And that makes it a lot easier to see subtle uh, differences due to Jupiter's gravity. Uh, where are we? So 
So the ones that are at the right distance that get disturbed by Jupiter get kicked out very quickly. So these all started in a line out from the sun at, all, at the same angle. The only difference between them is their semi-major axis, how fast they go around the sun, and what's happened to them because of the effect of the gravity of Jupiter. You can pan around. All of these asteroids started out in the same plane. Some of them being kicked above or below the plane of the solar system. You can pause and click on an asteroid and unpause. Oop, let's try that again. And now that asteroid will leave a trail. And you can see how it's uh, moving. And you can watch this for weeks. It's hypnotic. I, I've sat this and left it running on my second monitor for like a week at a time just to see all the cool patterns that come out of it. It's lots and lots of fun. So there's lots of cool um, concepts you can teach. You can watch the output and it, uh, you know, this object has left the solar system. This object has, um, oh, that's interesting. Trail look. Oh, I just discovered a bug. You shouldn't have seen that. Uh, and what else have I done? I wrote a game. Oh, let's have a look at this one first. Oh, great. A game that I broke. All right, I won't show you the game. Um, the code is very simple. Uh, if you want to look at the Mars one, for example, again, it's just a combination of creating spheres, boxes, changing their positions, changing their colors. Anything about this 3D model that you can define at the beginning, like a color, a position, a diameter, a shape, you can change on the fly and have objects changing in size and color and, and uh, other properties as, as the program uh, interacts with them. You can uh, just type it up command line. You could just do Python from vpython import star v equals sphere. Let's see if I can type. And as you type, it opens up a window to display the results of your typing. Sphere dot color equals vector one comma zero comma zero. Well, oh, that was done. B dot color. I can't type when people are watching. And it didn't work anyway. That's odd. That'll teach me again not to do live demos. Anyway, that's about all I have. Uh, I hope you'll get some use out of it and start doing funky 3D stuff. And all of this stuff is available here. That's a link to GlowScript and vPython and the code that I was demoing. Hopefully it'll be working by the time we download it. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions from the floor? Thank you for, hello. Thank you for your talk. Uh, when you model objects, do you have to use the primitive, like spheres and uh, cubes, or can you uh, maybe import uh, from other common uh, formats like DXF or STL, can you import any objects? Not easily, no. Uh, there's lots more primitives you can use. You can define a 2D path and then extrude it along a, uh, a, a 3D shape and then extrude it along a path, for example. You can build up quite complicated shapes using the primitives they give you, uh, but there's no tool for directly importing them from Povray or whatever. There is a tool that will take your vPython scene and export it to Povray, um, but not the other way that I know of. But I've never really used Povray or any other blending machine. It might be that one of them has developed a tool for doing it, but I, I don't know of it. Other questions? No. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm sure if you've got any questions you do want to address to Andrew, you can approach him and see what he has to say. We are about to move into... Uh,